Section 24 of Astounding Stories, 14, February 1931, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet, by Charles W. Diffin. Chapter 18. The wires that bound the two men were removed, and McGuire and Sykes worked in agony to bring life back to the hands and feet that were swollen and blue. Then, red guards who forced them to stumble on their numbed legs, where darting pains made them set their lips tight, a car that went swiftly through the darkness of a tube to stop finally in another building, a room with metal walls, one window with a balcony beyond, high above the ground, a door that clanged behind them, and the two men, looking one at the other with dismayed and swollen eyes, knew in their hearts that here, beyond a doubt, was their last earthly habitation. They said nothing. There was nothing of hope or comfort to be said, and they dropped soddenly upon the hard floor, where finally the heavy breathing and nervous starts of Professor Sykes showed that to him at least had come the blessed oblivion of exhausted sleep. But there was no sleep for Lieutenant McGuire. There was a face that shone too clearly in the dark, and his thoughts revolved endlessly in words of reproach for his folly in allowing Althora's love to lead her to share his risk. From the night outside their window came a ceaseless clatter and hubbub, but to this he was oblivious. Only with the coming of morning's soft golden light did McGuire know the reason for the din and activity that echoed from outside, and the reason too for their being placed in this room. Their lives should end with the sailing of the fleet, and there, outside their window, were the ships themselves. Ships everywhere, as far as he could see across the broad, level expanse, and an army of men who scurried like ants, red ones, who worked or directed the others, and countless blues and yellows who were loading the craft with enormous cargoes. "'Squawk, damn you,' said Lieutenant McGuire to the distant, shrieking throng, "'and I hope they're ready for you when you reach the earth.' But his savage voice carried no conviction. What was there that Earth could do to meet this overwhelming assault? "'What is it?' asked Sykes. He roused from his sleep to work gingerly at his aching muscles, then came and stood beside McGuire. "'They have put us here as a final taunt,' McGuire told him. "'There is the fleet that is going to make our world into a nice little hell, and Torg the Beast has put us here to see it leave. Then we get ours and they don't know that we know that. Your first way was the best, the scientist observed. We should have done it then. We still can. What do you mean? The flyer's voice was dull and lifeless. Sykes pointed to the little balcony and the hard pavement below. Althora, he said, and McGuire winced at the name, seemed to think that we were in for some exquisite torture. Here is the way out. It is a hundred foot drop. They think we are safe but they have been unintentionally kind. Yes, his companion agreed. They don't know that we know of the torture. We will wait, and when I am sure that Althora is gone, when there is nothing I can do to help. Help? queried the professor gently. There is nothing now of help, nor anyone who can help us. We must face it, my boy. C'est fini. Our little journey is approaching its end. There was no reply, and McGuire stood throughout the day to stare with eyes of smoldering hatred where the scurrying swarms of living things made ready to invade and infest the earth. Food and water was pushed through the doorway, but he ate sparingly of the odd-colored fruits, the only thing that could hold his thoughts from the hopeless repetition of unanswerable whys was the sight of the fleet, and every bale and huge drum was tallied mentally as it passed before his eyes. The ships were being loaded, and with their sailing, but no, he must not let himself think of that. Throughout the day, ships came and departed, and one leviathan, ablaze in scarlet color, sailed in to settle down where great steel arms enfolded it, not far from the watching men. Scarlet creatures in authority directed operations, and workmen swarmed about the great ship. Once McGuire swore softly and viciously under his breath, for he had seen a figure that could be only that of Torg, and the crowd saluted with upraised arms as the scarlet figure passed into the scarlet ship. This, McGuire knew, was the flagship that should carry Torg himself. Torg and... he paled at the thought of the other name. The only break in the long day came with the arrival of a squad of guards, who hustled the two men out into a passageway and drove them to another room, 
or certain measurements were taken. The muscular figures of the two were different from these red ones, but it was a moment before McGuire realized the sinister significance of the proceedings. Their breadth of shoulders, the thickness of their chests, what had these figures to do with their captivity? And then the flyer saw the measures compared with the dimensions of a steel cage. Its latticed shape could be endlessly compressed, and within he saw were lancet points that lined the ghastly thing throughout long enough to torture, but not to kill. A thousand delicate blades to pierce the flesh, and the instrument, it seemed, was of a size that could enclose the writhing, helpless body of a man. Other unnameable contrivances about the room took on new significance with the knowledge that here was the chamber of horrors whose workings had been seen by Althora in the mind of their captor, horrors of which she could not speak. McGuire was sick and giddy as the guards led him roughly back to their prison room, and Professor Sykes, too, required no explanation of what they had seen. The guards were many, and resistance was useless, but each man looked silently at the other's desperate eyes when the metal cords were twisted again about their wrists, and their hands were tied securely to metal rings anchored in the wall beside the window. And there, said the flyer, goes our last chance of escape. They were not as dumb as we thought. They knew how good a leap to the pavement would look after we had been in there. Less than human, Sykes was quoting the comment of Althora's brother. I think Jorn was quite conservative in his statement. McGuire examined carefully the cords that tied his hands to the wall beside him. The knots were secure, and the metal ring was smooth and round. I didn't know, he said as he worked and twisted. But there might be a cutting edge but we haven't a chance. No getting rid of these without a wire cutter or an acetylene torch, and we seem to be just out of both." Professor Sykes tried to adopt the other's nonchalant tone. "'Careless of us,' he began, then stopped, breathless, to press his body against the wall. "'It's there,' he said. "'Oh, my God! If I could only get it! It might work! It might!' The battery, he explained to the man beside him, whose assumed indifference vanished at this suggestion of hope. The little battery that I used on the gun to fire the explosive, it has an astounding amperage and a voltage around 300. It's in my pocket, and I can't reach it. You can't keep a good man licked, McGuire exulted. You mean that current might melt the wire? Soften it, perhaps, depending upon the resistance. Sykes refused to share the other's excitement, but we can't get at it. We've got to, was the answer. Move over this way. The man in khaki twisted his arms awkwardly to permit him to bend his body to one side, and beads of sweat stood out on his forehead as the strain forced the thin bonds into his wrists. But he brought his agonized face against the other's body and gripped the fabric of Sykes's coat between his teeth. The twisting of his head raised the cloth an inch at a time, and despite Sykes's efforts to hold the garment with his elbow, it slipped back time and again. McGuire straightened at intervals to draw a choking breath and ease the strain upon his tortured wrists, then back again in his desperate contortions to worry at the cloth and pull and hold, and try again to raise the heavy pocket where a battery made sagging folds. He was faint and gasping when finally the cloth was brought to where the scientist's straining fingers could grasp it to writhe and twist in clumsy efforts that would force the battery's terminals within reach. I'll try it on mine, said Sykes. It may be hot, and you've had your share. He was holding the flat black thing to bring the copper tips against the metal about his wrists. McGuire saw the man's lips go white as a wisp of smoke brought to his nostrils the sickening odor of burned flesh. The metal glowed, and the man was writhing in silent self-torture when at last he threw his weight upon the strands and fell backward to the floor. He lay for a moment, trembling and quivering, but free. And the knowledge of that freedom, and of the greater torture they would both escape, gave him strength to rise and work with crippled hands at his companion's bonds. Till McGuire, too, was free. Free to forget his own swollen, bleeding wrists in compassionate regard for the other. Like an injured animal, Professor Sykes had licked with his tongue at his wrists, where hot wire had burned deep and white, and he was trying for forgetfulness an hour later in examination of the door to their room. 
What is the idea? McGuire inquired, when he turned from his ceaseless contemplation of the fleet. Not trying to get out, are you? I am trying to stay in, said Sykes, and looked again at the object that interested him. These long bolts, he explained, top and bottom, operated from outside, but exposed in here. They come together when unlocked, five inches apart now. If I had something to hold them apart... You haven't a piece of steel about five inches long, have you? Or anything to substitute for it? If you have, I can lock this door so the devils won't come in and surprise us before we can make the jump. The battery, suggested McGuire. Sykes shook his head. I tried it. Too long. And besides, it would crumble. They operate these with a lever. I saw it outside. He went on silently with his study of the door and the little gap between heavy bolts which, if closed, would mean security from invasion. They're about through, McGuire spoke from his post at the window after some time. The rush seems to be about over. I imagine they'll pull out in the morning. He pointed as Sykes stood beside him. Those big ones over beyond have not been touched all day, only some of the crew, I judge, working around them. And way over, you see forty or fifty whaling big ones. They must have been ready before we came. They have finished on these nearby. It looks like a big day for the brutes. And Professor Sykes led him on to talk more of the preparations he had seen, and his deductions as to the morrow. It was all too evident what was really on the lieutenant's mind. It was not the thought of their own immediate death, but the terrible dread and horror of Althora's fate that hammered and hammered in his brain. To speak of anything else meant a moment's relief. Sykes pointed to a tall mast that was set in the plaza pavement, some hundred feet away. Wires swung from it to several points, one of them ending above their window and entering the building. What is that? he asked. Some radio device? That ball of metal on the top might be an aerial. But McGuire had fallen silent again, and stared stonily at the deadly fighting ships he was powerless to combat. On the morning that followed, there was no uncertainty. This was the day and from a balconied window up high in the side of a tall stone building, two men stood wordless and waiting while they watched the preparations below. The open space was a sea of motion like flowing blood, where thousands of figures in dull red marched in rank after rank to be swallowed in the mammoth ships that McGuire had noted in the distance. Then other colors and swarms of what they took to be womenfolk of this wild race a medley of color that flowed on and on as if it would never cease to fill one after another of the great ships. Transports, that's what they are, said McGuire. I can see now why they have no steel beaks like the others. They don't need any rams nor ports for firing that beastly gas. They are gray, too, while the fighting ships are striped with red, all except the scarlet one of Torg's. Those are colonists we are watching, and soldiers to conquer the earth where the damned swarm settles. He stopped to stare at a body of red-clad soldiers, drawn up at attention. They made a lane, and their arms were raised in a salute that seemed only for Torg. They stood rigid and motionless. Then from below the watching men came one in the full splendor of his scarlet regalia. The air echoed with the din of his shouted name. But the bedlam of noise fell on deaf ears for McGuire. He could hear nothing, and in all the vast kaleidoscope of color he could see only one object, the white face of a girl who was half led and half carried by a guard of the Red Ones where their emperor led the way. It was a strangled cry that was torn from the flyer's throat, the name of this girl who was going to the doom she had failed to avoid. Her life, she had said, was hers to keep only if she willed, but her plans had failed, and she went faltering and stumbling after a scarlet man-beast. "'Althora!' called the flyer, and the figure of the girl was struggling with her guards in a frenzy that tore their hands free. She turned to look toward the sound of the voice, and her face was like that of one dead as her eyes found the man she loved. "'Tommy!' she called. "'Oh, Tommy, my dear, good-bye!' The words were ended by the clutch of the Scarlet Emperor, who turned to seize her. A clatter came from the door behind them, but Lieutenant McGuire gave no heed. Only Professor Sykes sprang back from the balcony to seize and struggle with the moving bolts. The man on the balcony was hardly less than a maniac as he glared wildly about, but he was not too unreasoning to see the folly of a wild leap into the throng below. He could never reach her. Never. 
and his eyes fell upon the wire that led from above him to the great pole in the open plaza. There was shouting from behind where the executioners were wrestling with the bolts. Hold them, the flyer shouted, just for a minute. For God's sake, Sykes, keep them back. There's a chance. He sprang to the balustrade of the balcony, but he saw as he leaped where Professor Sykes had raised his leg to force the thickness of his knee between the bolts whose levers outside were bringing them closer together. Go to it, was the answer. I can hold them, a stifled groan. For a minute, Professor Sykes had found his substitute for five inches of steel, and the living flesh yielded but slowly to the pressure of the bolts. McGuire was working frantically at the wire, then held himself in check while he carefully unwound it from its fastening. There was a splice, and he worked with bleeding fingers to unfasten the tight coils. And then the end was free and in his hands. He dropped to the balcony to pull in the slack, and he wrapped the end about beneath his arms and twisted it tight, then leaped out into space. No thought of himself nor of Sykes in this one wild moment, only of Althora in the grip of those beastly hands. He was struggling to turn himself in the air as the colored masses of people seemed sweeping toward him, and he shot as a living pendulum, feet first, into the waiting heads. He was on his feet in an instant, and tearing at the twisted wire that held him. About him was clamor and confusion, but beyond the nearer figures he saw the one who waited, and beside her a thing in scarlet that shrieked orders to his men. He flung off one who leaped toward him, and ducked another to dash through and reach his man, and he neither saw nor felt the creature's ripping talons as he drove a succession of rights and lefts to the blood-red face. The scarlet one went backward under the fusillade of blows. He was down, a huddle of color upon the pavement, and a horde of paralyzed soldiers had recovered from their stupefaction and were rushing upon the flyer. He turned to meet them, but their rush ended as quickly as it began. Only a step or two they came, then stopped, to add their wild voices to the confusion of ear-splitting shrieks that rose from all sides. McGuire crouched, rigid, tense, and waiting, nor did he sense for an instant that the assault was checked and that the faces of all about him were turned to the sky. It was the voice of Althora that aroused him. Tommy, Tommy, she was calling, and now she was at his side, her arms about him. What is it, Tommy? Look! Look! And she too was gazing aloft. And then, above all other sounds, McGuire heard the roar. The clouds were golden above with the brilliance of midday, and against them, hard and sharp of outline, was a shining shape. A cloud of vapor streamed behind it as it shot down from the clouds, and the thunder of its coming was like the roar of many cannon. A ship of the Red Ones was in the air, a fighting ship whose stripes showed red, and it drove at the roaring menace with its steel beak and a swirling cloud of gas. It seemed that they must crash, when to McGuire's eyes came the stabbing flash of heavy guns from the shining shape. A crashing explosion came down to them as the great beak parted and fell, and the body of the red-striped monster opened in bursting smoke and flame, tore slowly into fragments, and fell swiftly to the earth. It struck with a shattering crash some distance away, but one pair of eyes failed to follow it in its fall, for in the clear air above, with the golden light of distant clouds upon it, a roaring monster of silvery sheen had rolled and swept upward to the heights, and it showed, as it turned, a painted emblem on its bow, a design of clear-cut color, unbelievably familiar, a circle of blue, and within it a white star and the bullseye of red the mark of the flying service of the United States. McGuire never knew how he got Althora and himself back to the building whence he had come, nor did he see the struggling figures on a balcony, or the leap and fall of a maimed body, where Professor Sykes, when the door had yielded, found surcease and oblivion on the pavement below. He was to learn that later, but now he had eyes only for a sight that could be but a dream, an unreal vision of a disordered brain. He held the slim form of Althora to him in a crushing grip, while he stared, dry-eyed above, and his own voice seemed to shout from afar off. They're ours, that voice was screaming in a frenzy of exultation. They're our ships. They've come across. The fighting fleet of the red man-things of Venus was taking to the air. The ships rose in a swarm of speeding, darting shapes, 
and the great one of Torg was in the lead, climbing in fury toward the heights. Far above them the clouds of gold silhouetted a strange sight, and the air was shaking with the thunder from on high, where straight and true a line of silver ships in the sharp V of battle formation drove downward in a deadly swift descent. And even afar off the straining eyes of a half-crazed man could see the markings on their bow, a circle and a star, and the colors of his own lost fighters of the air. End of chapter 18